and my sort of style is oh, I'm not even sure if I have a style, but are you a Juju um, or are you a Monty? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Episode of Finding Your Front, the official um, New Zealand Rugby League podcast. Uh, my name's Cliff Thompson, well-being manager in New Zealand Rugby League. Kia ora, my name's Ali Lohititi. And uh, again, we just like bringing stories and having some conversations about well-being and uh, what it looks like to be well using the vehicle of Rugby League to do that. Uh, today we've got a really special guest, uh, mm-hmm. really, really excited, grateful, uh, and it's an honour to mm-hmm. talk to our current Warriors skipper, um, Tohu Harris. Brother, thank you for coming on. Um, let's start there. Who was Tohu Harris? <laughs> Man, <laughs> nah, just a yeah, just a normal person, really. Dad, husband, and um, just happens to play footy on the weekend <laughs> <laughs> with everyone watching, right? Yeah. No, I appreciate that, bro. And um, you know, we're going to journey through this and talk a little bit about where you come from and what what you've been up to, but. Just again, I think it's it's a nice place to start where you say, hey, look, I'm just uh, a human being with a family and just like other people. And I think without the joke, jokes, jokes aside, like it actually is that you're, it's just everything that you do in your job is on TV and in the media yeah. and people get to, get to see it. So I think this is nice to be able to actually have a conversation with you because it's probably a side a lot of people don't get insight into. Um, so let's start there. Bro, uh, going right back. Um, where do you fuck a papa back to your family? A little bit about your upbringing and your family ties, and then we'll just sort of build the story from there. Um, yeah, how far back? Um, <laughs> yeah, like we were mentioning before, um, uh, the Harris side of my family from up north. Um, so Mutukaraka, Mangamuka, um, and my mum's side, so the Moffats, they're, they're from down, right down the bottom of the South Island, Waikaya, near Gore, um, so far, far south, and then um, grew up in Hawke's Bay, so um, my granddad and grandma settled in, in Hawke's Bay and um, in Hastings there, and, and a little little suburb called Waipatu, and um, yeah, my parents, oh, my dad grew up there, and, and I grew up there, so spent my whole life there. Until I moved to Melbourne. Yeah, right. So it's pretty cool because you represent both islands, eh? North and <laughs> yeah, South. So yeah. if you're listening in, <laughs> represents everyone. <laughs> nice, bro. And you talk about so your upbringing in, in, um, in Hawke's Bay. Mm. Yep. What was that like? And what was your sort of first introduction into rugby league? Um, yeah, oh, it, was <laughs> it was a typical sort of small town. Um, grew up around a whole lot of family. Um, actually lived down the lane. And it was like three houses down the lane. Front one was my grandma's house. My auntie and her family lived with her. Um, middle one was my auntie's house, and then the back house was was my house. So it was uh, the lane's probably about hundred and probably hundred meters, hundred and twenty right. meters long. And so we were just constantly about thirty kids playing sports and competing against each other, playing cricket or skateboarding, and rollerblading, mm. like all manner of different things. Whatever's in the um, yeah, whatever's happening in, at school at the time, um, we're all doing it down the lane every day, playing touch, and um, yeah, so that was sort of what it was like growing up. Yep. Up there, it was just constantly playing sport yeah, with playing the sport. cousins, yeah, yeah. And so, um, you obviously playing sport, yeah, you, you get scouted, you get picked up. How does how did that happen for you, talking in terms of finding your way over to Melbourne, as you mentioned? Um, yeah, it was. Well, there was a lot of luck involved. Well, I I like to think there's a lot of luck involved. Right. Um, so I it, I had a teacher at school who was a part of the Central Falcons like men's team. Mm. Um, so they'd travel to Palmerston North every couple of days for training, and um, I think he was teammates with Russell Packer it was oh. when when he was playing in the Barco Cup, and um, so they had an under. I can't remember if it was 13s or 15s. Um, so that teacher used to take a couple of us students um, with them to training and then we'd go off and train with the right. the other team. And um, But the the men's coach at the time was David Lomax. Ah, yep. um, so, so it was through him. Um, when the Storm were holding a camp in Wellington, he, he had a house with a whole lot of young up-and-coming boys like, going through Polytechnic and trying to trying – to, 
go through the Wellington Academy, yeah, Rugby yeah. League Academy, and he sort of just called my parents saying that there's a camp on, um, right. you know, yeah. sort of go and stay with him and then and then attend the camp. And um, they didn't really tell me what was going on. They sort of just worked it out between them and, <laughs> and pretty much forced me to because I wasn't the most – probably still not, but the <laughs> most outgoing person yeah, or right. um, I was never someone who like, threw myself into yeah, things yeah. or put myself out there. So they pretty much forced me to go. And mm. um, it was from that camp was was um, lucky enough to be uh, one of two people given scholarships um, wow. yeah. uh, from the storm. Yeah. What was that, 2000? And- 2000. Well, that camp would have been, it was either 07 or 08. Wow. Yeah. Right. And so from there, Must you no make the transition over to to Melbourne at some point? Well, this is, this is where some of the luck come in <laughs> as well. Um, so they used to have – it was obviously a scholarship and they they would hold scholarship camps. Yeah. And um, I I never – I don't know if my dad didn't check his emails or, right. or what it was, but I didn't, didn't get to attend one of them. Um, ah. So I never knew they were on and I would see – uh, so, so the other guy was TJ Perinara. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'd see him at like um, rugby tournaments, and he'd ask like, "How come you didn't come?" And I was just like, <laughs> "Come to what?" I didn't, oh, true. Didn't, yeah, didn't know um, what was going on. And then um, this is where sort of luck was involved. Like the late Darren Bell, he he still offered a under twenties contract yep. for when I finished school, um, without me sort of attending these camps yeah. and without like me being able to sort of – so it was just off those two days at this camp they held in Wellington that they still decided to offer an under-20s contract and then finished school 2009, went over for preseason um, at the end of 09 for the 2010 yep. season and um, did preseason with the 20s and sort of went from there. Yeah. What was that like, you know, going over as a young one, as a young guy um, from Hawke's Bay, you know, going over to Melbourne and – what was yeah, what was that like, man? You know, just training with the boys and then you know, that environment, you know, it's a professional environment. So what was your mindset or what was the yeah, what was the junior there? It was it was an eye opener. Um going from small town um to a big city like Melbourne, um mm. catching public transport, trying to um manage like a, a semi professional environment, um, mm. training, look trying to look after yourself and um, so living, it was the first time living out of home, and had no family over there. So yeah, that was it was it was tough. The first year was real tough, but I was pretty pretty lucky that my performances on the field were still mm. um, still going well on the field. But yeah, off the field it was it was tough. Yeah. It was some. Um, and some, so, what sort of helped you to? Yeah, because I appreciate you saying, man, being honest about it, it was tough. Were there some things that you either did or were there people or what were the, the things that helped you in those tough parts to sort of get through it? Because you, you stayed there a long time. <laughs> yeah, well, well, pretty much like parents sort of telling me, well, you're yeah. not coming back. You know, pretty much forcing <laughs> me to stay there. And um, But like in all honesty, like I sort of didn't really figure out any tools to cope with it or – or um, never really sort of dealt with it properly until until I met my or well, now wife. But yep. um, back then, it was, so I was met her at the end of my second year there. So I was only nineteen yeah. when I met her. Um, met my wife Nat, and um, wasn't until sort of met her that I sort of she helped me through a lot of things and right. and sort of. Gave me ways of trying to mm. trying to work it out, and it out, yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was a mixture of performing well on the field and and um, meeting her. That was what the real sort of key to help solidify it. So yeah, you had to break it down. And would you, you know, looking back now, is there some things that were evident that you kind of did? Like obviously, maybe you know, I don't know um, your preparation, training, or. I don't know, change your eating or just hanging out with different, you know, with the right boys. I know the boys would have been some of the young boys there, you know, especially um, would have been crack up, some funny personalities. <laughs> so that would have been an influence too. So you could have went their way or 
stuck on the on the narrow and and just you know um, put your head down and train. I don't know. What did you do if, if you had to look back now? Was there some stuff that was evident that helped you? Yeah. So um, so it wasn't until uh, so like had a good good year like twenty ten, but at the end of the year I had surgery and right. <laughs> like come back with some weight on and yeah, right. um, had to like worked really hard to get that off and then had another surgery. So it was, there was a, a lot of injuries those first or second and third years. Um, and it wasn't until sort of the end of the 2012 season had a long knee injury during that year. Right. And then um, before the preseason, um, Nat and I sort of spoke about it and we spoke about, like really giving it a, a crack and looking after my body properly and and mm. not letting that be um, deter my chances of of um, playing in the NRL. Yeah. Um, obviously not ba- debuting at that time. So um, so it was the the preseason before the twenty thirteen season that um, like really sort of took things seriously off the field mm. in terms of like recovery. Um, yep. Eating a lot better and and stop drinking altogether and um, and it was it was almost instant the effects of it like right. um, that was the only preseason where I was sort of completed every single session yeah. in the preseason and then was like went through the trials and got selected to go over to the World Club Challenge and yeah. so just like from those yep. decision off field decisions that um, my wife and I spoke about. Um, making like as soon as I made them, positive things started happening, and so that was a that was probably um, a real indicator of yeah. how I should, continue. I guess, yeah, continue throughout my career and and nice. behave throughout my career. So, yeah. Um, yeah, like having those conversations with with Nat were, was huge to sort of, I so guess, having a good woman, eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would have been all lost. <laughs> <laughs> Shot that. <laughs> nah, yeah, and she's awesome, bro, in terms of just the organization and her, uh, the way she is, I know. Um, but then just talking about sort of you, you make your NRL debut and you just sort of mentioned it there. What was that like from a, not just from a footy perspective, but, you know, it's the dream and, and it's now you put the hard work in, it's become a reality. Um, was there a, while there's, uh, Excitement and euphoria is the other side of it, which can be some challenge or pressure mm. to perform. And where does how does that all sit with you? Can you remember your debut and were there points that challenged you or you found pressured at that time? Um, yeah, it's funny. Funny you mentioned like it's the dream. It, it, growing up in Hastings, because like league wasn't, mm. it, it was all rugby union, and um, the league didn't. Um, it almost didn't seem like a reality. So. Right. So there wasn't really sort of any yeah. <laughs> any dreams there. Like there, you obviously grow up, you know, with the dreams of playing for the All Blacks, all the yep. all the things that mm-hmm. most kids have, and um, would watch the Warriors on on some occasions and stuff. But never really, because I didn't grow up around it. Sure. Didn't really sort of, um, you know, think of it as a Consider as a dream. Yeah, so yeah. my my like honest dream was to. All I wanted to do was just play for our local rugby club with my brothers. Like that, yeah. that's all. All like <laughs> yeah. that's as far as the ambition went <laughs> f- uh, for me growing up. And um, so I'm lucky I had good people around me that sort of put me out there because like I wasn't doing mm-hmm. it. Um, that sort of were ambitious for me. And um, but once I sort of, I guess that after that, it was probably that first under twenties year where I sort right. of started playing and had a really good year on the field. That I sort of thought, there were moments where I sort of thought, like, mm. I can really give this a crack. Mm. Yep. And um, and I, obviously being at Melbourne, I sort of would look at their team and thought, like, it's going to be hard to yeah. hard to make that side, but um, I can sort of really give this a crack. So the when I sort of got selected to debut, it was pretty, pretty surreal, and sure. almost didn't really know how to act. And yeah. um, but I guess the pressure of that was more more along the lines of I was playing along some of, alongside some of the greatest, greatest players yeah. that have played the game. So 
the importance of me just just doing the simple things and doing my job right. uh, was probably like higher than I guess what what someone else would yeah. normally do, no, just because of like the standard that they play at and and um, the, like their values and all that all that sort of stuff. Like, is just me doing my job, just yeah. the bare minimum, yeah. was the importance of me doing that. Right. That doing I put on myself well was, and... yeah, was was huge. So I guess that that pressure was pretty big. But yeah, um, yeah like it's it's made easier when you play with mm. some great players. It's great because I, that's why I like these kind of platforms. It's you know everyone has a story, and we were just talking to one of the boys before, and he kind of had like you know people that he could look up to. He had a vision, and hearing your story was like, shucks, kind of things just kind of fell into place for you, and you still worked hard. I think, you know, watch. I remember you coming over to 2012 or 13 over the UK, or yeah. And I remember you played playing against the the Rhinos, and you know they were talking about this young, you know, this young guy coming through, and <laughs> you definitely uh, played well and uh, made some noise over there. And then you could see how you forged your way through hard work, determination, and whatever the but man, awesome work, man! It's, I yeah. loved yeah, just hearing these stories. It's cool, something different. You know, I think um, which sort of leads us segues to um, what I'm going to ask you now, which is about. It wasn't long after that you end up debuting for New Zealand, right? Mm. You, you made the Kiwis, and yeah. and re- all of a sudden you're representing your country. Man, talk us through the, through that. What what was that like? Um, the first time you put the the Kiwi jersey on, and what did it mean? Did you think much about what it meant for for you, your family? That whole experience, yeah. I think I think more afterwards I did because the the lead up to game was a strange week. Uh, it was, I think, they were a few days into camp um, when I got called up into the squad, right? Because I think, uh, I'm say it might have been Jeremy Smith got suspended. Oh. They were trying to fight it, so it took a few days for them ah. to find out whether he successful. And he got suspended, so I got called into the squad as 18th man. Yep. And then it wasn't until like captain's run, um, Dewey pulled out with a calf injury. So, right. so it wasn't until after captain's <laughs> run where I actually come into the squad. And so didn't I was, like spent, well, it wasn't even the whole week. It was only yeah. a few days um, yeah. in camp in Canberra that that I was in the squad. And, and those few days were spent like – Trying to work out how to prepare as an 18th man, yeah. and try and try and prepare someone else so he can perform, and um, and then yeah, so it was a pretty surreal few days sure. there. But being able to run out on the field, or I guess standing doing the national anthem, and then and doing the haka, that was um, with with um, my wife, my yeah. mum and dad, and my father in law in the stands was. Um, Oh, that's like it's a moment yeah. I, that I I'll always remember. remember. Labor, yeah, yeah, it was special. Yeah. It was something like minus three degrees. They were, <laughs> they had beanies, they had big jackets on and stuff. But it was it was um, special for me and yeah. my family. Yeah, and I think um, just there's something in when you talk about like you being sort of caught in or go so quick. A bit of a weird week is all sort of last minute. You're 18th man, and all of a sudden you're in the squad. But that's testament to. It's the things you were talking about earlier, right? Like being prepared, mm. um, having the preparation. Because I don't think you can have the confidence to get out there and do it at that level if you hadn't prepared yourself and all your small things, all the things that you've been talking about here. So I think that's really important to highlight. Mm. Uh, really cool, bro. And um, so, so sort of going from that, we fast forward a little bit to you, you find your way back to the Warriors. Um, here now where you are, obviously, and you've been here a few years now, because uh, in this part, I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of obviously we know your skipper now and and your leadership style. But before I get to that, just coming back to the Warriors, uh, what has that been like for you? Because you've sort of been here through the COVID period as well, and and now we're home, and it's it is different. Um, but what's it what's it mean to be back at the Warriors and to be here and and to be to be playing rugby league here now after this time? Um, yeah, well. Like it's been a bit of a journey being back here. There was there was a point where um, I'd spent more time in Australia as a as a warrior than mm, than I did true. here in New Zealand. So, um, but being back here after COVID, um, like it's been unreal. It's it's right from the start. As soon as we got back, it's just been um, my family's been happy. Everybody, mm. 
everybody that's involved in the club is just like there's that sort of um, the gratitude of being here and being a part of the club and even mm. guys who aren't from New Zealand like they've really bought into to being here in New Zealand and and you can see how much they're enjoying mm. being here at the club and and enjoying the New Zealand culture and um, so it, it is it is a different feeling but it it that's the sort of best I can explain it. It's, yeah. It feels like home. Yeah. Um, and for, for different reasons, we, we sort of, um, I get, I, it's hard for me to say that we had that feeling in the first two years sure. that we were here. Cause we, I think as a family, we moved around a lot. Yeah. So it was hard to sort of figure that part yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, after after COVID, we've we've come home. We're living in our own home and mm, nice. sort of got our own little community. Um, Stable, eh? Yeah, and, yeah. and, and um, everywhere we've lived, my son, well, we've lived in a lot of different places, especially during that period where we got moved around. Um, my son would call the places we lived by the what, town or city oh, that we're yes. in and stuff like that. So the first time he's called it home. So right. yeah, so um, that obviously yeah. helps. <laughs> so how was that? Like you know, I know COVID. I know we talk about COVID all the time, but you know, I'm sure some some of the viewers or even the fans that know how tough it was over there. I think, I think we were talking to some of the boys, and mm. I think at times you were confined in one little space, you know. And so that must be tough, you know, as a as a person, but you know, let alone a player that's mm. going out and playing on the field. Yeah, no, there there is some. Certainly, some dark times through that period. There are times where we were in one country and fa- our families are in another. Mm. And there are times where we were together. There are times where we we're in the in the same city but different hotels. Like it just was. There was just never that um, consistency of mm. of trying to find your your home base. Like we had long periods where we did, but. Um, Eventually, that it would, something would change, and we'd have to get moved or right. go from Terrigal to the Gold Coast or yeah. whatever it was, um, and then to Redcliffe. Like there were a number of different changes. I think the players all up, players who did three years, we, there was something like eleven moves or something like that. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, no. You talk about you know we talk about balance, stability. How tough is that? You know, me moved around. Resilience. Uncer- yeah, mm. uncertainty. And so, uh, awesome what you guys went through. Definitely, so, um, yeah, speaks volumes. Yeah, and um, sort of coming off the off the back of that, Tohu, you know, as captain now, and you said the mm. boys are settled, it feels like home. And, you know, early in the season, but we're doing some great things. You guys are doing some great things and being around the club a bit, you get a sense and you said it's hard to always put your finger on what that is, but it feels like home and it feels a bit different. But you being the leader is sort of what I'm getting at. Uh, mm. You're the captain. And I know it's never always just one leader. There's a few people that might be in a room. But you've got that C beside your name. And it's sort of a two-part question. How do you feel carrying that leadership mantle is one? And what would you describe your leadership style to be? Because like you said, you're not the guy that will push yourself out there, but you're a guy that leads by example. And no one would sort of argue otherwise. Um, but how does it feel to to be captain? What does it mean to you? But then also the second question is, what is your leadership style? How would you describe you as a leader? Um, so well, first of all, like it means a lot to have that sort of that scene next to my name. Um, there's been some special players to to hold that here at, here at this club. Yeah. Um, so it's not a it's not a position that I sort of take lightly and and want to make sure that like I want to be performing first and foremost as 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 performing on the field if I'm going to be the captain and um, so that's something that is I actively think about every week mm. is like how am I going to perform like what the team needs me to do mm. and and I guess every player sort of probably does that but um, I, I guess. I'm sort of not really giving myself much wiggle room with yeah. that having the captaincy in my name. It's yeah. I've, I've got to get it done, um, and my sort of style is oh, I'm not even sure if I have a style. But <laughs> are you a Juju um, or are you a Monty? Or, uh, <laughs> <nah>. <laughs> Juju. <laughs> um, I I just like trying to not let it let it change me. Like mm. just I think the biggest thing 
is just being myself mm-hmm. and um, and trying to give guys confidence that way so that they can be themselves. And because if you if that makes sense, like no, having that playing with that authenticity and and that they they're confident in, in being themselves, then obviously their performances will yep. um, will be their best performances. So yeah. um, in terms of like yeah, I've I've I'm someone who I don't like things not being uh, being left unsaid. Yeah. But if someone has said it, then I'm not going to sort of Up on just speak to yeah. you know, hear my own voice. So if if it's something and and that's been something that like Webby's been really good at, and we've got guys in the room that have a, had a lot of experience. So um, so there's not a lot of times there's there's nothing yeah. left unsaid, left but unsaid. Um, like it's actually like. It bugs me if something is left unsaid, mm-hmm. so I have to say something. And um, so I don't know if that sort of answers the question on, on no, a sort of mean. leadership style, but um, yeah, like I, I know, I know, even in my own family, at one point they sort of thought I'm a quiet person and stuff like that. Like I'm, there's there's some guys that I sort of have to take a breath yeah. before I speak to. Yeah, yeah. Um, otherwise, like I might. Well, as you alluded to, be a Monty, <laughs> but um, I don't think I'm. I'm probably that Juju. that harsh. Yeah, it's, it's probably a mixture of a bit of both. But um, yeah, I try and be as calm as I I can be, and sort of be as level headed as I can. But yeah, yeah, you no. do a good job. Eh? Yeah, good I job, agree, eh? and I think it. That's the beautiful part about leadership. It's it's being authentic and mm. being okay with who you are, and letting your actions speak. And, yeah, and when so, you, like you said, when when you have to say something, it's measuring your words. And, and I like that, bro, that you mentioned about it's ensuring that what's important isn't left unsaid. Mm. But if it's being said, then that's okay. Yeah. Um, those things are really powerful. Um, and, yeah, and with, with, like what Ali said, I mean, you're doing a great job. And I think, obviously, Webby wouldn't see you as the leader and the mm. captain if he didn't see that in you. Um, but also seeing, you know what you said before, um, seeing the other boys excel and play well, mm. then that's massive too for a leader. Yeah, shop yeah. is really cool. So outside of footy, um, what are your interests outside of footy? Bro? You, you mentioned about Nat and your son, and uh, you know a lot of fam. I know that from being part of seeing your profile that day, um, that family time and stuff is important to you. But what yeah. other interests do you have outside of YouTuber playing? No, <laughs> playing footy. No, um, no, it's it's really, really sort of just them um, mm. spending spending time with them. Like I play video games and stuff like that just to sort of switch off and yeah, yeah. and not think about footy so much but um, what, do you, what do you jam bro what's your game oh anything playing 2k at the moment and <laughs> stuff like not even not even online like just, just like it's Create a by myself just spend and just, time creating your play all the time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. but it's just just time just to like, honestly just switch right yeah. off and and not think about much it's just mindless so yeah um but yeah, other than that, just time with the family and nice and you know, we've got our own sort of little community that we like spending time with and um and that sort of like added a lot to our lives and 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 helped that feeling of home that we spoke about yeah, me. earlier. Because like, yeah. we don't have any family here in Auckland, like my family's down in Hawke's Bay and hers is over in Melbourne. So we've got no family here in Auckland. So yeah, right. having that, I guess that um, our own little community and, and building our own sort of whānau, then that sort of that, – that's helped us and added to our lives. So, um, yeah, there's, there's like key people that we sort of spend spend time with then. Yep. Otherwise, yeah, we just – 2K? <laughs> <laughs> just A little bit of that. Three, yeah. Nah, that's cool, bro. Appreciate it. And, um, look, man, home stretch. we talked about finding your front. Right, that's what this whole corridor is about. And you've mentioned a whole lot of things here that re- uh, sort of relate back to what has helped you in your career. But if you were to, as you stand where you are today, looking back on your career, looking back at where you are, standing where you are currently, what would you say helps Tohu Harris find his front What in a, in a life way? What are the one or two things that you would share keep you well, keep you moving forward? It's probably having perspective. So... It's, we've we've been through a whole lot of um, challenges over the last few years, mm. and 
Um, so anytime they sort of come up against a challenge or or if it's a little niggle or whatever it was, like having that perspective of, um, you know, seeing seeing you know the, my wife and my son, if they're happy, then yeah. like there's nothing that's more important than that. So, um, like I can go through and feel down on myself and things like that, but is it is that I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but is that really like what's more important to me, or is yeah. it or is it or is it like Making sure that my wife and my son are, are happy and yeah. knowing that, so. yeah, knowing that they're happy, then like it helps me get through any of the challenges or any of the niggles. It helps me keep going because you know it's it's sort of it means more to me. Yeah. yeah. Do you chat with Craig much, Craig Bellamy? Um, I haven't haven't um, in a long time actually, but. <laughs> He looks a little bit angry at, at the moment. So, <laughs> um, but when when we do play them, when we see him, have a little chat to him, and yeah, um, yeah it's always good catching up with yeah, all those all guys. Those yeah, connections all, you've been able to form me through. Yeah, and, we, and we've managed to. I was, I was fortunate to be a part of something pretty special yeah, there, and that sort of forms a forms a bond that uh, you you can always sort of look back on. And yeah, awesome, and it widens what you talked about. Widens that network of hmm. connection and support people. There's people for different contexts, say, that you can talk to. So yeah. pretty special, bro. Um, Ali, any final thoughts before we round up the session? No, thank you once again, you know, for – I know your time's precious again, family time, but uh, what I learned, perspective, um, and love your leadership, and how you're playing the game, um, you know, uh, it's been awesome for us as fans and as all players, but no, thanks for coming on. And yeah, bro, again, just thank you for your time, Tohu. I know you're, um, again, family man and – Got lots, lots of responsibilities within the team, but um, we appreciate your time, appreciate your insights and your sharing with us. And hopefully, that you know, that's the hope is that someone will be helped or get some insight through some of these conversations. And <laughs> that's what finding your front's all about for us, man. So appreciate Still your Hawks time. Up the Hawks Bay. Cool. Thanks, Up the Warriors. The Waz. That's us. Another episode done and dusted. We hope that somehow this has helped you.